Welcome to this, the fifth and penultimate instalment of my epic voyage around South America on the cruise ship Marco Polo. At this point in the trip, we were coming up to a whopping 39 days since leaving Bristol. I think it's fair to say that home felt a million miles away, but this was a voyage that just kept on giving. For myself, the epic mountain vistas we saw on the previous leg of the trip through the Chilean waterways were always going to take some beating. As we headed north along the Pacific coast, however, we soon realised there were still a few surprises in store. Will you join us as we enjoy our final two port stops in Chile and head for Peru and Ecuador. Four days had passed since we left Ushuaia in Argentina and navigated our way north through the stunning scenery of the Chilean fields. Our next port of call was Puerto Montt and that pointy mountain you see in the distance is Osorno, one of several volcanoes in the area. I was mildly disappointed at not having been offered escort duties on the volcano tour, but I am pleased to say escorting the excursion to see the magnificent Petrohue waterfall more than made up for it. As well as the waterfall, we also stopped off at a llama farm, which proved particularly popular. And on our way back to the ship, we visited Puerto Varas, also known as the City of Roses, populated by several strange metallic statues. Puerto Varas is clearly geared towards tourists. After all the wild landscapes of the previous few days though, the craft stalls, cafes and live music was a welcome change of pace. Valparaiso was to be our penultimate Chilean port of call. In fact, we had two whole days to enjoy the place. As you can see, it's a busy port, complete with navy ships and jellyfish. Watching them load containers onto the massive cargo ships parked right next to us was an entertainment all in itself. We took advantage of the shuttle bus provided to take us into town, which was also a busy place, with bustling markets and interesting graffiti. I should also mention that a total stranger came up to me wielding a mobile phone, displaying a message warning me that these streets are unsafe, and that there are thieves about. Nice. Well, due to the odd place in which the bus had dropped us, we had to walk about 30 to 40 minutes to get to the old town, which would have only been a couple of minutes from the Marco Polo if they'd opened the gates for us. I don't suppose the exercise will have hurt us too much though. Day two of our stop in Valparaiso, we travelled into Santiago, the capital of Chile. 
It was an eight hour trip, featuring a gruelling two hours bus ride there and two hours back, with four hours to do your own thing in between. We climbed a hill, visited a museum and art gallery and watched the muddy river that runs through the centre of the city. We also found a park that was very pleasant to walk through, providing you didn't look too closely at the homeless people living in cardboard boxes, that is. Well, despite a few rough edges, I quite liked Santiago. It was nice to get back to the ship though after a long day and watch the sun go down as we left Valparaiso heading for our final Chilean port. Arica is the most northerly city in Chile. It's only 11 miles from the border with Peru and a mere stone's throw from neighbouring Bolivia. Leaving the ship was like stepping into an oven. Arica has some of the lowest annual rainfall in the world and is surrounded by desert. Well, after taking a walk around the central square, we enjoyed the cool interior of the Cathedral of San Marcos. Once sufficiently chilled, we headed for the large hill that dominates the city known as Morro de Arica. Well, from here, we enjoyed expansive views across the city and the desert backdrop beyond. There are also several monuments and statues on the top of the hill and a massive flag as big as a football pitch. But it really was the views that captivated us the most and did I mention it was hot? After two days sailing, we finally arrived in Caleo, the port city of Lima, the capital of Peru. The first part of our day was spent exploring a park near to where the free shuttle bus dropped us off. We enjoyed observing the local wildlife and it was an improvement on the busy shopping mall where those passengers hoping to have been taken to downtown Lima, where all the plazas are, had been dumped instead. Anyone wishing to travel further had to pay an expensive taxi for the privilege. Well, the mall was of no interest to us, but the park was enough to give us a slice of urban life in Peru's capital city. Fortunately, later that day, I was escorting a tour that took us through downtown Lima. Our drive through the city was as eye-opening as it was entertaining. Dodgy driving seemed to be the norm, as was a constant chorus of horns. Buses seemed to be a law unto themselves, and as for the pedestrians, they were a breed apart. Eventually, though, we arrived at our destination, and along with the throngs of people queuing to get through the turnstiles, couldn't wait to see what the park had in store for us. This was the Parc de la Reserve featuring an experience known as the Magic Fountains of Lima. There really was something here for everybody. Fountains of every size and shape, providing heaps of fun for all the family. And just as you thought things couldn't get any better, it was all topped off with a light show, the like of which I don't think I'd ever seen before. 
a stunning 20-minute visual extravaganza incorporating lasers and dancing coloured fountains. Three days of sailing and running on board painting classes brought us to Guayaquil in Ecuador and a chance to get up close and personal with the local wildlife, iguana. In Iguana Park they are literally everywhere. Some were hobnobbing with the pigeons while others ate their lunch. All were quite magnificent. Well, some were a little dog-eared and had the odd defective or missing limbs and some were much larger and older than others. It was a great little park though and I have to say very entertaining. The Malecon is a long promenade running adjacent to the river. Being Sunday, it was clearly a popular weekend destination for the locals who enjoyed boardwalks, tall viewing platforms, street entertainment, parks, food vendors and even an amusement park. At the far end of the Malecon, things get a little more interesting, for me at least. It's here where the land rises and the hills are absolutely covered with multicoloured houses clinging to them and topped off with a blue and white lighthouse. The perfect subject, if there ever was one, for a bit of urban sketching. At first glance, Las Peñas, as this area is known, might look like a run-down neighbourhood, yet it is in fact the artistic centre of the city, hosting many art galleries and studios in its maze of colourful houses and huge flights of steps. Sometimes it's the complex and chaotic nature of a scene that attracts us to it in the first place, yet the complexity it invokes becomes the very reason we might avoid trying to draw it. There are several ways in which a complex scene might be tamed. For starters, it's a good idea to simply pick a spot and start making marks on the paper. Naturally, we should be aware of the perspective within a scene, but it's important not to be daunted by it. What's the worst can happen? If you make a mistake, just keep moving on and incorporate it into the drawing anyway. Well, I find one line will lead me naturally into another, followed by another. 
Further marks would just keep coming along, and the scene will have a tendency to develop organically. Drawing a frame around a subject helps to limit a composition, but it's also fun to allow some elements, such as the tree in this sketch and one or two of the buildings, to extend out beyond that frame. What I've done, in fact, is to use the outer edge of the trees around the bottom end of the scene as the frame itself. Psychologically, if nothing else, it helps you to feel like you've taken control of it, perhaps even tamed it. In urban sketching, colour can be used to create accents and help focus in on individual elements that might otherwise get lost. I've applied Prussian blue to the sky, but there are also other areas of blue within the scene which I'm applying with the same colour. Compositionally, this helps to maintain a sense of harmony and visual cohesion. Recycling colours are a great way to hold a composition together, binding individual elements with a common theme. In urban sketching, there are no rules. You can box your scene in and allow chosen elements to pop out beyond the frame. You can leave it as a monochromatic line drawing, or you can add colour to it, as much or as little as you fancy. Well, on this occasion, I've decided to go for a minimalist approach, which helps to keep it clean and coherent. Well, I haven't chosen to do it here, but a few text notes can also add interest and context to a sketch. Remember, all observations are valid. And so we're setting sail again, bound for Manta, our second port in Ecuador and the last stop before the Panama Canal. The 45-minute journey back downriver to the ocean as the sun was setting was a visual treat. Deep rainforests and interesting waterways reminiscent of the Amazon lined our route, punctuated by the occasional wooden homestead and flocks of interesting birds. Best of all, there was a lovely breeze up on deck. Much like Guayaquil, Manta has a sizeable iguana population, and a similar park in the town where they can usually be seen lounging around, doing iguana things. Today, however, they seem to be shy and reluctant to come out of the trees, so we spent most of our time on the seafront, looking at the many boats in the harbour and watching the wildlife. Local fishermen were busy working on their boats, fishing, playing cards, or sleeping in hammocks in one of the many makeshift shelters dotted along the beach. But we were more fascinated by the hundreds of seabirds, large and small, 
in particular the pelicans of which there were many. This was our final stop in Ecuador, the last opportunity we would have to gaze out across the Pacific Ocean and our last stop before tackling the Panama Canal, coming up in two days time. This would also mark the start of our final leg on this epic voyage before heading homeward. Bring it on.